Aloha, everyone, and welcome back to Awakening to the Magic of the Menstrual Cycle. Today, I have the beautiful Miss Rebecca Wilson here with us. Welcome, Rebecca. I'm so excited to have you here. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a, an honor. <laughs> um, it definitely is. You are one of many women that I actually have connected with from that part of the world for this. Mm. And I've been observing a certain similar energetic frequency within all of you. So I've been mm. finding that really interesting. What, um, are you in the UK? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. In oh, the cool. North, yeah, North of the UK. It just is rem it's reminding me of like the, um, like indigenous culture of that mm -hmm. Part of the world and it has made me think about um, different embodied female masters in the past like Mary Magdalene for instance um, yeah. and I just like can energetically see this this energy like awakening and activating in that part of the world and so it's been really fun for me to um, completely separately connect with several women but who are all kind of like part of this movement in the same part of the world and acting as divine channels for this feminine energy to flow through and I've just yeah. really been enjoying it. I'm glad that you're here. Yeah wow I'm sure that's actually amazing to watch all of the threads being woven together. Mm. Definitely. Um, I'm just going to read, <clears throat> I'm going to read a little bit of your bio for the audience, for people who aren't familiar with you. So Ms. Rebecca is a wound keeper, shamanic healer, wise woman, spirit baby, and birth doula. She, she facilitates shamanic womb healing and rights blessings and is the founder of Womb Connection Healing Awakening, which has been birthed from her personal journey of womb awakening, embodied movement, shamanic practices, and the feminine arts. She holds a powerful earth medicine. Uh, sorry, she holds a powerful earth-filled medicine within her shamanic healing practices, which naturally infuse all of her work and offerings. She is deeply connected to nature and finds her inspiration in the changing seasons and elements, weaving all these sacred energies into her studies, offerings, and teachings. <clears throat> Rebecca believes in fully embodying her work by using these practices to live a balanced life, deeply rooted in self-care. She holds events, workshops, and retreats across the world. Wow. I can't imagine what your workshops are like. <laughs> yeah, they're a journey. <laughs> I would love to start off by um, just talking a little bit about that, actually, about some of the workshops that you facilitate and yeah. kind of like what the out. Mm-hmm. So um, they're always changing because of my connection and, and my inspiration from nature and this path really being about my own personal journey of evolution um, and then kind of facilitating from that point. And of course, as we evolve, that point changes all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So I've never really taught anything more than once or twice or retreat mm. maybe i've i've held one theme of a retreat but only hold it twice in like costa rica and then europe so it's in different parts of the world so they've been very much about like where i am specifically at that time i've moved through that healing and then i'm in service of that healing to other women so that is kind of how it's flown so yeah they change all the time at the moment, obviously with the world the way it is, I'm holding my workshops online, which has been, um, yeah, a really profound experience because many women from around the world are able to join and they're joining from their own home. And for a lot of women, this is cultivating a, a deeper sense of being able to, to drop deeper into their journey. 
because they don't have mm. to think about driving home afterwards or they're in their own home where they feel safe or if they maybe still have some barriers towards self-expression in spaces with lots of other people or women, um, you know, or maybe they just couldn't get to me because they live wherever they live. So it's been a really interesting time to bring the work online and the practices have changed and the journeys have changed a little bit, but they seem to be deepening. Um, mm. So the offerings work are all around womb centered healing. So whether it's womb cleansing or activating the pelvic ball energy or working with the mm. ovaries, um, the yoni, the sexual gateways of the yoni, the G spot, the cervix. We also work a lot with the earth. So bringing the body into such a deep state of um, relaxation that the feminine spirit is able to move through and really allow the feminine to soften um, mm. because of this space that's offered to feel safe and be held completely safe uh, in this container and the energy. And uh, yeah, this is really coming through yesterday when I was uh, sat in nature about, you know, the feminine within us all, but within women really longing to soften and surrender and just kind of like, oh, and like just release all of that holding on and that control. Like we can feel that, right? It's so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But the control comes through because the feminine is just so scared because she doesn't feel safe. Like who's going to hold me if that happens? Yeah. And I've really, you know, I've been feeling in the air and there's threads within many workshops or courses or even just my sisters and, and people I've been talking to, you know, oh, I get really triggered when I get really soft. And then the mas my own masculine comes in and tries to like control or barrier the situation. And, and it, you know, it's rooted in long lineages of the feminine being just yeah yeah the wounds that have been cultivated from like rape murder like abuse all of the horrific horrific things that have happened you know through our bloodlines our ancestral lines through the land through mother earth and mm. yeah so offering in my work it's really about offering a container and a safe space in whatever format it arrives for the feminine energy or the spirit of each woman to feel so safe that she can just lay down on the earth and fully relax so the nervous system can unwind and she can just feel how it is to settle into herself mm. Mm. that sounds amazing and just from what i understand from my own personal experience and the dynamic of um the feminine energy and that whole piece about not feeling safe that's so deeply rooted into the collective of the feminine that's so i can only imagine just just that alone like actually really being able to provide a space that that legitimately allows a woman to feel safe like mm -hmm. for real I can't imagine that that alone would trigger so much healing just to yeah. really feel held because I know what it's like to not truly feel like safe deep in my bones. And I don't know if I honestly could say that I've ever really felt completely safe and I don't even know what that would bring about. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like not having that blueprint, you know, if, if we really dig super deep, have I ever felt completely safe to fully let go of all control and surrender into the moment or surrender into love, you know, beyond I love you, you love me, but just like the greater love of God, the divine, the universe, whatever we yeah. uh, are, are tuned into. Yeah, and there can be moments and glimmers and then, you know, the body can, I mean, you can feel it when um, you're super relaxed and then the body jolts when you're in that deep relaxation. There's mm. something wound in the body and the nervous system there that's like, oh, we're not safe enough to be that relaxed. Be mm. on guard, just in case something's, you know. Definitely. Well, it's been necessary for the survival of our species for so long yeah. to 
to be on guard all the time. So it's it's really interesting looking at that energetically and seeing just how deep, deeply like intertwined that pattern is. And this, I don't think for the most part, we've even really been in a space collectively, um, especially for women to even like, be aware that we don't even fully feel safe. I don't even think that that's something that most women even think yeah. about even in our awareness, uh, especially because most of us don't have the experience to reference to. So we don't even know what we don't have. <laughs> exactly. And like you say, that can be either a huge sigh of relief when a woman steps into that space like when yeah. women step into circles with me or mentorships, programs or courses, and they're like, whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. And it's this like, oh, or they get that moment of feeling exceptionally triggered. And they're like, what is, what is this? What is this? And it's like, this is what it's like to be held in love. And they get so triggered because they've never experienced it before. Mm -hmm. And it has to break down the whole structure and the whole blueprint that has been formed around what love is and what safety is and what it is to be, you know, in yourself and fully accepted as a part to, well, these, this is not safe, but you've created it to be safety in the mind or the body because it's the only blueprint that's been available or, and this is where we see lots of like codependency and narcissism, you know, there's lots of labels um, and words, but beyond the energy of that, it's like labeling something that is safe and love, which it isn't because there's been no blueprint for the truth of what it is. Yeah. Um, it was just making me think about how something like this could be potentially very challenging for a woman to experience because it is totally unknown territory. And mm -hmm. that alone can be triggering when we're in a new space, even just energetically, we've not ever experienced before. That mm -hmm. is usually triggering to our ego because... Yeah. Uh, because we just don't know it. So, yeah. So, what sounds, like, sounds like very powerful work. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And yeah. I mean, you know, there's, there's a great, I feel like there's, there's a space within the healing world where this is being done in mixed groups and, you know, with men and women. And I'm sure it definitely has its place. But what I've found is this space where actually women, who have never felt that and there is that trigger in that it's the, the safer way into that path of feeling safe within yourself is to be held by another woman which we would have done mm -hmm. in ancient times and you know we would have been in our circles in our tents in our sisters you know it, we're living in a very different world from what is actually quite fresh within our cellular makeup and it only has to go back a few generations and the way that our ancestors or our like lineage were living was so different to now and we are you know the in, the kind of breaking down of the cells of that but we're living in this world that's just like whoa so we know it and there's something about that when we step into circle with women or into a space or whatever the space is a container it's like ah oh, I know this but I never went to a circle before and you know I have heard that so many times I've never done this before but I just feel like I've done it all of the time and I'm like yeah because this is our innate thing this is what we would have done in past lives in like our timelines in our family lines our bloodlines like so there's that real sense of arriving home and there's something really mm -hmm. beautiful about it being another woman a sister and I feel I hold a very like maternal energy. So that kind of like mother energy, which again is a huge wound that, you know, can, can be present or the sister, mother wound, sister wound, you know, women having fear with other women and being yep. able to offer that space where it's like, there's no judgment here. There's no competition here. I'm me, you're you. We're both divinely beautiful in our own mm -hmm. uniqueness. Come sit mm -hmm. in the circle and, tell me who you are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That alone is, is very, um, powerful and healing. That's that sisterhood wound is something that I have experienced since I was a little girl. 
I moved around a lot and was always new and was not um, as easily accepted. So um, it's actually interesting because that's something that building the summit has been, this, that's a medicine that the summit has been giving me is, is helping nurture that aspect of myself that never really felt true sisterhood. And um, it's interesting to not have the experience before and mm -hmm. to start getting it and realize that that's a kind of medicine that I don't think you can get anywhere else. It's not even something that you can get with your partner, no matter how much you are in love with them or um, from therapist or anything like there's something very special about mm. the of sisterhood specifically for women yeah. anyways I'm like tuning into more and more every day and um mm. just realizing yeah. how much we need it everyone yeah yeah it's so needed for women's health actually to be around other women you know, we sink in our cycles when we're with other women, we sink hormonally, our, you know, the chemicals, and like on so many levels where they see it scientifically or we see it esoterically or energetically or emotionally. It's so needed. And the world, to, I feel like things are shifting now because of what is happening. It's going to have to. But in the yes. same respect we're all being cocooned in our family units whatever that might be or look like mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people if if you live with friends then you have that already but if you're like locked in with your partner and your children in this kind of like pod like um unit we're kind of forgetting and life has been very much like that like you know we close the door at the end of the day and we don't it's that kind of um flow and we're kind mm -hmm. of forgetting how much community is so important you know for all aspects for our own well-being for our relationships well-being for our partners well-being for the children you know they say it takes a village to raise a child how can they get everything that they need just from one or two parents and then maybe a grandparent they here and there it's not possible and that's the way that most families still exist even without quarantine is two parents trying to be the entire village for a child. And yeah. I, I feel so much for, <laughs> for everyone that has children that doesn't have a village to help them yeah. with it. Because it's a really big deal to, to raise another human being. Um, yeah. And yeah. I've also been thinking about that, the, the way that we've been like cut off um, from community and also how much the contrast that is being built right now is creating um, grounds for like a really beautiful kind of like a, a collective sigh of relief when everyone is finally connecting again. I feel like the connection is going to be so much richer and deeper and more meaningful because we haven't had it. And I think that Mm. that is going to be really healing for a lot of people just not having it for a while yeah yeah <clears throat> and I feel like a lot of people will be missing something during quarantine that they potentially didn't even take full advantage of anyway you know but everyone mm -hmm. has friends and they're living these busy lives and you just chat a little bit on the phones and 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 now they've, it's like that thing isn't it like you didn't really have it because you wasn't actually dedicating time to all of your friends and your family but now it's been taken away you really want it it's like a child like children you know go to your room and be naughty like you know for the toy or whatever but now we've got this ch chance to see like oh okay like I'm really missing seeing my family. How much time did I actually dedicate to family, which is so profound anyway, and so important. Mm -hmm. and how much time did I dedicate to my friends or, and we really get to see how we have or haven't been showing up pre lockdown quarantine and how we want mm -hmm. to show up and how much energy has been or was being given to work or yeah, it depends on the structure, but if you're working like a, a Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of um, 
vibe it's never really that the longer hours there's travel and you know how much time and energy was being given to that and not being given to these nourishing relationships yes as i you just like pulled the words out of my mouth i was just thinking like how how much of your energy have you been giving to stuff that isn't nourishing you in return and uh i honestly i mean i know that this has been a really big deal for the planet and i think for those of us who have been working through healing trauma and wounds for years, I think we have coped a little bit better because we've already been in the work and um, kind of conditioned to know what it takes to recover from trauma. But I just have been like observing the whole thing and just have been fascinated at just how much change on every level has taken place and is still taking place from this one tiny little mm. thing. Uh, it's just like, when you really look at it from like a, a broader perspective and like a soul level, it's like, I'm just in awe at how perfectly this has been orchestrated to facilitate so much change on so many levels throughout the entire planet mm -hmm. without, you know, having a world war or some of the other devastating options that a planet could potentially go through to wake its species up into a, a more evolved state of being and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's like a higher intelligence because the consciousness of the planet is much higher now than it has been in the past when there's been pandemics or wars or the breakdown of economy. And so we are in a higher state of consciousness. So the intelligence of what happens is more like this. That's how I see it rather than, yeah, kind of Definitely. echoing what you, you shared super yeah. interesting and it really brings it down to you know my auntie said a few weeks ago she's like i can't believe that this one thing like you said just created all of this and i'm like but isn't that interesting for us to realize that just one small action or behavior that we make has a consequence in the whole of the collective mm. yeah that's a really good lesson to get out of it mm-hmm <laughs> I think about that sometimes and about some of uh, the more out there concepts that I have learned about how important what happened on earth is to the rest of the universe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, wow, we're, it's really exciting to be a human on the planet right now. And yeah. what, doing it may seem so trivial but at some point we are going to know the impact that the decisions that we made and the efforts that we put into the way that we live this life and what we do not only on behalf of our own personal growth but for the collective mm. like i can't see it because i'm not really tuned into my psychic abilities, but I know I'm going to be able to one day really see the larger impact that each individual has had. And that's just really exciting to me. <laughs> yeah. I watched a, a documentary, um, which is on YouTube. It's called Aluna and it's about the Kogi people. And the whole documentary is about them showing, um, they're called, the, the western world little brother because their language was had to be translated so many different times um and they talk about how all of the things that they'd built on this the, the coast of this one place in colombia there was like seven sites where the water entered the ocean and they built like factories and all these things and they were trying to tell them how them building the things at the bottom affected the top of the river and the the lakes in the mountains and, you know, the, the kind of Western white man was like, no, this is not possible. The water travels from the top to the bottom. The bottom can't affect the top. And so they mm -hmm. went on this big expedition. And anyway, you know, talking to all of these specialists, 
and you, they came to the truth and he had this huge realization that what they had been doing at the coast had affected the top as much as the top then affects the bottom and it was just so interesting you know the perspective of this man just changing and him just like oh, and it's that it's you know everything affects everything definitely what was that that you were watching it's called a luna a luna. A luna yeah and it's called it translates to conscience yeah where were like you watching that? youtube so it's free to watch i would cool. highly recommend it yeah i'm definitely gonna watch that um thank you for sharing that so i I remember when we first connected about the summit, um, there was one thing that you said to me that just really struck a chord of resonance in me that I was like, oh, wow, that just makes so much sense to me. And I wanna talk a little bit more about this with you. Mm -hmm. You said that the menstrual cycle was the original shamanic journey. And that was so fascinating to me because when I, first started getting onto this path of working more consciously with my own cycle and healing that piece of me, I couldn't really put into words what was happening. But basically for me, um, <clears throat> I was blessed with aligning with a lifestyle that gave me some more freedom. And it started off just staying home while I bled. Mm. And that was huge because I had always been forcing myself to go to school or go to work and, you know, be a waitress and a bartender and a cashier and like be exposed to these massive amounts of people while I'm in this really vulnerable state. And, and when I finally didn't have to do that anymore, I started having these profound healing experiences where I was just on my yoga mat and it was like these massive amounts of energy releasing from me and me just like crying, like wailing, like a baby, like I had never cried before and just so much like revelation and like insight and things that like points of view that I had not seen before and just so much healing taking place that the only thing that I could compare it to in any other experience that I've had was working with psychedelics, mm. um, like working medicinally with psilocybin and the way that that journeying worked in the consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have anybody tell me um, anything about shamanism related to the menstrual cycle until you said that. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's exactly what I've been doing. I've been going through this journeying with my menstrual cycle. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because I was just talking to you about the other women that I have connected with for this summit that are in that area of the world. And pretty much all of you have brought uh, womb shamanism mm. to me. And I didn't even know that that was a thing really until I started building the summit. So I yeah. just am so fascinated to see it come from so many different angles. And it's been really wonderful to like kind of connect the dots within myself and to see it more. Mm -hmm. um, from that perspective, it just makes so much sense to me. And um, I would love to hear more from you about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> well, first of all, yeah, just really honoring that moment of like, oh, <gasps> because things just land and then it just opens a portal within us, doesn't it? So it's, it's so profound. And really like your experience that you were having with your menstrual cycle and the healing for me it's just a real reflection of the truth that all the medicine lives within us within our bodies within ourselves and we can use different mm -hmm. tools outside of ourselves or different plants or different medicines to access parts of ourselves 
but they're only ever a vehicle or a tool to access ourself and they're very valid for certain parts of the journey but also like you said you've ch you've tapped into this part of yourself in your menstrual cycle without any external kind of medium mm -hmm. and so it's just a real reflection that the magic lives within us mm. because of Definitely. course like we are because the cosmos lives within us so of course the magic's there what's out there is in here um yeah. yeah so that journey that you you share really is when we honor the menstruation part of the cycle which when women are first starting out with their like menstrual awareness everybody always knows the menstruation part right because there's a, there's this like proof there's blood it's like oh yeah i know when i get my bleed or i know when i get my period so i kind of know my cycle and it's like you no know, you know just one part is a very beautiful part of it but there's so many other parts to know about uh, seasonally like the bleed being winter then pre-ovulation spring ovulation summer premenstrual autumn so we have mm -hmm. a full kind of uh, cyclical experience within ourselves, which is the seasons of nature and nature herself and you're following the path of nature as a very shamanic tradition to follow mm -hmm many indigenous cultures that you know they sit and be with nature and watch the seasons watch the cycles and that's how they learn so mm. we turn that education or that knowing inside and honor and look at the how we move through all of the seasons inside of ourself like what am i like in spring what am i like in my summer what am i like in my autumn what am i like in my winter so that's like the first level of understanding this cyclical nature within ourself and understanding the patterns that show up in each part, each season, um, the emotions, our energy, what, what we like to do, what we don't like to do. And from that, even if somebody who's listening doesn't have the, the lifestyle or the ability to um, completely take charge of their own diary, for example, once you've tracked your cycle enough, you'll be able to kind of know, oh yeah, I'm average 25, 28, 30, 34 days, however many. And you can really feel into your diary and know, okay, they're the three days that I'm going to bleed in. Well, unfortunately they're work days, but I just won't schedule extra curricular stuff those days. And my energy will have to be work, home, rest. Because mm -hmm. life does happen for people. Yes. If you are blessed enough or you're in a lifestyle where you're able to manage your own diary, then you're able to better kind of work around giving you, yourself those days off. So the whole of the cycle is the shamanic journey because we're honoring the seasons of nature. But for me, the menstruation time is like the deepest shamanic journey like the yeah the deepest part of the journey and that correlates to the energy of that part of the cycle so we're very deep in our yin energy our feminine mm. energy so lots of schools of tradition and, and different ways of wording it like yin in chinese me medicine the lunar energy the feminine energy it's all the same energy uh, which is mm -hmm. like the downward flowing energy the descending energy which makes sense, right? Because the blood is descending out of us and down and the rest of the cycle, it's kind of moving up and then we do a downwards. So we have this balance to be a whole being, but this particular part, we're coming into autumn, pre-menstrual, everything's starting to slow down. And if we can fine tune ourselves to know when that's arriving, it's like, ah, oh, I can feel that everything's slowing down now. So my practices will change, my movement will change, my lifestyle, my activity, my food, all mm. to support that slowing down, that turning inwards. And then as winter comes, as the bleed comes, that is when in history women would have journeyed. They would have spent those three, four days you know, modern world is very different. So at least the first day or the first two days, but if you can take the first three days or four days of your bleed and they would completely rest, like no activity, you know, the movement would be to go pour yourself a bath or make a herbal tea or get some food, 
but really way back, like because the bleeding woman was in such reverence, the masculine or the men of the tribe would actually honor the woman who was bleeding wouldn't even stand up. She would just lay down the whole time because she's bleeding. Mm -hmm. And he would get the, or her other sisters. So either the man or the, her other sisters would look after her. But as we know, most women who live together end up bleeding together, which is where the red tent is formed because the red tent was the bleeding tent where all the women would go together and bleed together and give their blood to the earth. And as my personal relationship has built with this part of my cycle, the menstruation, I really feel the wisdom of the blood. You know, the blood is, um, it's in, it's our bones, right? It's, it, and our bones are our ancestral line and they are ancient wisdom that is passed through the bloodline, the bone line, the ancestral line, the collective, the earth line and there's so much to be found there to begin mm. with it's a source of your own healing because what comes up in your menstruation time if it's like fiery rageful anger it's showing you the parts of yourself the patterns within yourself that are to be healed to be looked at to be moved through to be purified to be felt for things to shift and change and eventually when that kind of layer has been journeyed, the deeper aspect of it is for me, higher states of consciousness come through my blood. So I get the biggest downloads, the biggest inspirations. It's when I write most of my work, which then four or five days after I've bled, I read it and I'm like, who wrote that? Because it's just like the channel is open because everything's yeah. open the crown's open this top crown and also the feminine crown like the crown of the pelvic cradle is mm -hmm. open and it's like <sighs> coming down into mother earth and mother earth is coming back up and I really honor that you know just like how we started this talk like that deep softening and relaxation and rest at that time the body receives so much like on whatever plane of or level of healing we are meeting that journey at healing the body healing the emotions maybe healing different ailments within the self and then eventually this like portal opens where when you're bleeding you're just in this constant journey you are like living between two worlds which is the shaman's path the, the, the shaman's world you know whether we see it as like time traveling or um living between earth and spirit and you're just kind of like in and out of those transitioning between those two states accessing different states of consciousness you're able to just journey you know with very little need for anything outside of the self what we might need in other parts of the cycle like a drum or a rattle or some herbs or some plant medicine or anything else some cacao with the with the blood the blood can take us it's like the red river can just we can just float on mm. down and it's all there we don't need anything outside ourselves in those days mm. yeah i love all of that thank you so much for sharing that um i never really got the definition mm. of shamanism or a shaman um and I think that like a lot of words in our modern day society, it's been like overused too much and too many not as appropriate ways. So it's yeah. it's really helpful to hear the the nature piece of that. And mm -hmm. because that totally makes sense to me looking at all the indigenous cultures around the world who have shamanism and it, who like whatever the shaman is of the tribe being very very close to nature and almost like a different being entirely and not like a normal human because they're so um so connected to nature like i almost can see like um this image of like this being even like having like a little bit of like wood or moss growing on them because they're so one with the natural world around them. So mm -hmm. it's really clear you say that. Um, yeah. And I, I've been like 
really integrating more and more of the information from the women that I have spoke to about this and what I've been learning and um, like journeying through my own cycle. And I just was talking to someone this last cycle, trying to describe this to a man who has no reference point of what it's like to menstruate. And I was, uh, I was talking about how like, um, it was like reminding me of like descending into like the, the belly of the ocean where there's no light. And I was like seeing this certain type of fish that didn't really have eyes to see, but it had all these other receptors to like pick up uh, different energies. And that was kind of like what I was thinking of in menstruation because it's really challenging to describe but when you really start getting into it, what yeah. changes take place in the psyche of a woman mm -hmm. because her vision and ability to function in the outer world is totally different. And yeah. she doesn't see nearly as much as she would see outside of herself, but there's so much more that she's tapped into on the internal plane. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah i mean i always find uh with women that i've worked with them starting off with that whole like explaining to the masculine or the men in their life about seasons because they can kind of they have an a felt experience of like everyone likes a blanket in winter and likes to be cozy and warm especially if it's like a cold part of the world and you know if it's like <laughs> the desert in winter it is a little bit different but that kind of seasonal shift where it's like everyone you just want to stay in and hibernate and then that kind of difference between that and then summer where it's sunny and it's warm and you've probably got less clothes on and you're just feeling a bit more fruity and everything's like woo play out and you know go on your summer holiday and that is really tangible because the masculine men have a felt experience of that because they move through the seasons even if they don't have a deep connection to nature, everyone knows seasonally when the world changes, right? Yes. Even explaining this to women who maybe are really disconnected from their own cycle or maybe more in their masculine energy, so, but they still understand seasonally. Yeah, yeah, things mm. change. Da, 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 da. Um, yeah. yeah. Those real deep complexities that happen within. It's interesting to try and explain that to a man, to a partner, to, you know, a father of a young girl. Um, yeah. I always sit with the question, like, is there really a need to try and explain something that's inexplainable and rather just a request that this is honored? Mm, definitely. Like, yes. Yeah. How do we, the masculine doesn't like loads of words anyway. So trying to explain to them, there's like this little sensation and then this, and then this, and then this, and they're just like, oh, tell me the end point of this because I'm getting lost. And it's probably pushing them too far into their feminine. And they're like, I don't like this. I'm feeling things. So it's just <laughs> like the masculine part of them. So rather than just like at this time, when a woman is so rooted in herself, she can really clearly say, I'm in my winter. I'm in my bleed state. Like, there will be nothing done from me for the next three days and I need that to be honored. Mm, nothing yeah. else really needs to be explained, right? Definitely. Just like, I think, yeah. mm. I think, um, I don't know, maybe that's like a part of my astrological sign of just being a Virgo <laughs> and being really analytical and, mm. uh, uh, very like masculine in that uh, intellectual want need to like understand things and explain it um, but um, it's really good when you can you can receive that understanding at least that there's some some sort of change taking place that needs to be honored whether they understand or not um, yeah. for me personally I have found it because like, you know, um, especially like right before the bleed, mm -hmm. when we can get really sensitive and triggered for nothing, <laughs> just from someone talking, even if they're saying something nice, sometimes that just feels like nails on a chalkboard because mm -hmm. we're so inward and it doesn't feel good to be 
bringing our energy outside of us, even for conversation. Mm. And, um, <laughs> and I know that a lot of women struggle with that part because they don't understand why they're feeling that way and they don't want to feel triggered by somebody even just trying to be nice to them. Um, one of the ways that I have personally found to help make a connection with a man, for instance, to understand that dynamic is like, um, like when you're sick, for instance, because every guy knows what it's like to be sick. And when you're not well, you're much more introverted and much more sensitive to your yeah. physical surrounding. And so that's a piece that I have used personally, um, talking with somebody who doesn't know menstruation to just explain mm -hmm. that piece of like being really um, introspective and yeah. mm -hmm. having like all of your energy inward I think that has personally helped me feel better and be able to kind of like explain so the other person knows where I'm at energetically mm -hmm. and then it's not personal yeah. to just be mindful that that's where I am right now. So mm -hmm. it doesn't even matter what you say. It might feel awful to me because my energy yeah. all needs to be inside. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, yeah, really about clear communication, which is interesting because at those points in the cycle, we don't have as much clarity in our communication because we're so inward, trying to then bring the voice outwards. It's like, blah, 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 blah. I don't even know how to put a sentence together, you know, kind of thing. So maybe having those kind of conversations about that part of the cycle, when you're in a more communicative part of the cycle so spring summer when um speech and communication and the brain is kind of all working in like all fired cylinders it's like but you know in like a week's time i'm going to be in autumn and then a week after that i'm going to be in winter so let's just have a chat about what is potentially coming you know while you're able to communicate choose the right point in the cycle not like mid bleed and you're like i'm trying to say what i'm trying to say but it's not coming out and <laughs> Definitely not good to try and explain everything while you're bleeding. No. <laughs> no, like no phones, no text messages, no conversations, no work meetings, you know, bleed on it. Do not respond because <laughs> the blood will uh, take you into some kind of like emotional expression where you're writing like essays of poems or, <laughs> or, you're, or you're just like pure fire, like <laughs> there's just like no space in the middle. Um, yeah. But I was feeling into this and actually it's super interesting because of at the time of autumn and then going into winter, because the womb lining is thickening, it's, the womb grows like quite a lot bigger than she is in the spring and summer. And so of I course know. our natural size of our womb is like this and that's how we establish our center. But as the womb grows, how do we find a center there? Well, like, where's my center? Because the center's bigger and more swollen than it normally is. Mm -hmm. This is like premenstrual clumsiness and falling over and keep on dropping the things. And I'm like, what's oh. happening here? And I'm like, oh, I can't find my center because I'm like all over because the womb is like trying to. And that's why we can't <laughs> find ourselves like like physically just being clumsy or emotionally can't center ourselves or as as quickly or or as or as easily as we could in other parts of the cycle because of course our center is bigger than it was and we're trying to like regulate that mm. oh that's such a good way to put it i have noticed that um for me oftentimes that's when because i'm usually very graceful with my movements but right around menstruation is when if I'm gonna have some type of accident it happens if that's yeah. when I cut my finger when I'm chopping vegetables or something and it's that those types of things that have made me um that have just added to that knowing that I what I really need to be doing is resting and allowing myself to really honor that 
mm. that receptive time of menstruation because that's in in the the cyclical patterns that's that's the dreaming time for us exactly. when we are receiving the visions and healing for our life and i think that's when um like for a woman and like for past me who didn't know all of this that's when it can get really messy when you're in relationship or you're um you're interacting with other people because especially if you have a lot of healing to do mm. and wounds and stuff to work on that's naturally coming up when you're bleeding and if you don't honor that time and allow yourself to just focus on what's happening with you and you continue to interact with other people then you it gets really messy and then you include other people's energy in this mm. work that you're doing and then it gets like confusing because yeah. you've already got all this stuff surfacing that needs yeah. your undivided attention and then you bring in somebody else's stuff and then it, you don't know who's who's and then like I think that's where a lot of women get like jumbled up and where a lot of relationships can suffer because there's this really important delicate process taking place inside and if you don't know that's what's happening you can really make it a lot more complicated and messy for yourself and for whoever you're um, yeah. in relation so because we're just so open you know menstruation is the same kind of, it's a smaller process of giving birth right so when women are giving birth they're not trying to like fix all the things around well they hopefully they're not they're just there focusing on birthing that baby they're not like trying to cook clean do the whatever do the other stuff and menstruation is, you know, it's a birth of the womb lining. So we are giving birth. It's just to a much smaller pregnancy or a much smaller cycle than a nine month and obviously a smaller womb lining than a child. But it's the same, same process, uh, just a, a, a smaller version of it. And yeah, so if we really honor it as that, you know, and sometimes actually being really clear about what is happening, like, you know, my womb lining grows and then I start to get cramps and that means that I'm going to shed my womb lining and it comes out as my menstruation blood. Mm -hmm. It's super clear. It's a visual for the masculine and they're going to be like, whoa, okay, do you need anything <laughs> to help? Because <laughs> that sounds like a lot. <laughs> I remember when I uh, when I actually first saw like a visual representation of the different size of the the womb from when it's not bleeding to when it is bleeding. I was just like, yeah, like if a if a guy had one of his organs swell to be like twice the size as it normally is, it would be a big deal. So just to think yeah. that like actually a, a serious physical thing taking place inside of a woman's body every month and to think that culturally um we're not honoring that we're just expecting women to continue to show up like nothing's happening when they literally have an organ in them that is like being gorged with blood at, yeah. i mean just that alone not even like the the emotional, mental, or, or the, the changes that happen in the psyche, like, it just is insane to me to think that we're just, like, forcing women to continue to show up for their normal workload yeah. when there's, like, this massive change happening within them. And that has been such a big part of what has inspired me to do this work and this summit and to hold the women's circles that I have and to share menstrual cycle awareness because it's not okay in my eyes that we're not supporting women through this change and yeah. we're just expecting them to continue down this linear path of production and dishonoring their needs and the wisdom of their bodies. That's, I think the suppression of the mental cycle is a main piece that has caused serious mental illness in women over the ages yeah and you know i feel like going back a few cycles um it's definitely the suppression of the power of the feminine 
her power in the descent, her power in taking radical rest, her power in being still and communicating with nature or being with a, the herbs in a cup of tea or journeying and what power that has, you know, and it's a power that's so unseen. It can't be scaled or put on some kind of like computer system or spreadsheet or it's just can't be understood by the linear masculine mind of men and women and the culture mm -hmm. but it's just it's uncharted territory it's like oh my god what is this and so it's like if we don't know what this is and we've got no way of measuring it or controlling it well what we will do is we'll make it wrong and we'll take make it shameful and we'll make it disgusting and dirty and squash yeah. it to squash that power that unseen mysticism and that mystical power that all women have and when women are in tune with their cycles and they are you know like they're very at home with their body it's like oh she you know she's in a power but it, it's that fine edge for people for the, for the masculine linear world definitely mm. well and it just goes to show how deeply programmed we have been men and women to like fear something that's different and out of the norm i mean that just makes me think about the the salem witch trials and mm how devastating a woman being in her power has been in the past. And, and I look at that wound specifically, which brings us back to the very beginning of our conversation of a woman not truly feeling safe. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, safe in that power. Type, yeah, and that type of wound oftentimes doesn't even really start to surface until you start really stepping on the path of what your soul is here to do because that requires you to be seen mm -hmm. and that is so scary for so many reasons you know the history of being burned alive because you've been in your power the that sisterhood wound of not being celebrated and accepted because of your uniqueness. And mm -hmm. there's just, there's so many things around that, that fear of being seen and not really feeling safe that unconsciously holds so many of us back from really living the life that we truly want within ourselves and, and following the path that we know is true for us and and that is some of the medicine that I personally feel like working consciously with your menstrual cycle can give you. <laughs> Absolutely. And I feel like, you know, we, there's either this arrival at a point in the journey where enough healing has been done to witness that or some kind of like huge impactful trauma that awakens this like shakti fire in women and they're just like like enough so whether they've been in abusive relationships or um tr like trauma family trauma trauma with themselves uh something you know will just like especially within the womb space like maybe uh womb issues or issues with their sexuality or like, for me the huge like i was already on the path but the the big like firebomb was when I had a miscarriage and I was just like oh right now I'm out here and I'm telling everyone about everything to do with the womb because and it was just like this it was a divine gift from God to have that experience because what it served for the greater humanity is just huge and just but this like this moment of this explosion and then just like no there is no more keeping quiet or thinking about what this could be. And maybe I could say that. No, it was all of that was gone. And it was just like, here I am <laughs> to the world. And unfortunately, sometimes we have to go into those darker pockets and then like, you know, to be able to come out back into the light. And uh, I'm personally mm -hmm. grateful for the whole, whole journey. Um, 
but it is a shame that we are in culture that it has to be one of those two things before you know we have to have either done some deep excavation work or had some kind of traumatic experience to then be okay in our power or to be safe to be seen to be light mm -hmm. to be vulnerable to be everything which is the feminine right she's everything all mm -hmm. the things yeah it's amazing how something so challenging and traumatic can in the end be so empowering and liberating mm -hmm. if you're really able to give yourself the space to heal and alchemize the experience and and receive what you're really meant to receive mm -hmm. out of it because it's it's always a gift from the divine that mm -hmm. gives you even more ability to serve others but you have to be able to honor your own process through the healing of it first yeah. and alchemize within yourself or else you just pack it around like more wounds that are eventually going to need sorting through. Um, so I'm just yeah. really grateful that there's so many women who are awakened to the magic of the menstrual cycle on the planet and answering the call to serve because I'm just thinking about the future generations of our our daughters and granddaughters and and building them a world where they know that it's a gift from the very start and they go through the proper rites of a passage and are supported and celebrated and encouraged and um, and we just live in a totally new world. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So, um, I want to ask you something from my own experience. Mm -hmm. When I was first waking up to journeying through menstruation, even I, though I didn't know that's what I was doing, I knew there was something really powerful happening and that I needed to, no matter what, make sure that I had space in my life to honor my menstrual cycle because whatever was taking place during that time was so, so important. Mm -hmm. I just had to figure out a way to keep space in my life to honor it. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning of this past, like several years ago, my journeys through menstruation were so profound and so powerful and like earth shattering. And I'm totally okay with it not being like that all the time. And I have noticed that it is, it is the trauma and the wounds that create that experience without something to heal. You don't have the grounds for these really powerful earth-shaking experiences because it is the, the journey through the healing that gives you that experience so that piece has made me really grateful for the trauma and the challenges that I have suffered through because the the healing of it has been so magical um and I think it's been like kind of my own expectations <laughs> at some point of wanting every journey to be that potent and powerful and they've gotten much lighter as I have healed a lot of my wounds and um, for me personally I've been wanting to like know how to be more intentional and ceremonial when menstruation comes because I don't have nearly as much healing work to do as I did years ago. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, um, for me or anyone else that is wanting to like deepen their experience through menstruation and through journeying, if you have any advice for how to be more intentional and ceremonial um, mm -hmm. in menstruation, even like, even if it's not this big massive <laughs> release yeah. and experience, but but to like really be able to to be more more honoring and ceremonial through menstruation, if you have any advice on that. 
Yeah, yeah. So I think, first of all, it all it always comes in waves. So your first experience of the power of your menstruation was through the release of pain, trauma, life experience. And then there's always a stage of integration when we've been through a huge healing. Uh, but for me now, like, you know, I've been on my womb path for many years. And of course, there's always little parts that can show themselves and past lives and ancestral stuff. But even when I'm not having a huge like healing time during my menstruation, it's still a very deep, deep journey. Um, mm. If you make it an intention to be that. And the intention is within like your actions. So carving out those days if you can, or making enough rest time in those days if you have to have certain um, appointments or work that you have to go to. Making sure you tell the people that are maybe in your life, if, especially if you live with them, like these days are for me. It's, all of that is carving out the energy for the body to allow itself to go into that space. Listening to music that you like that can really, really take you into a different state or reading or journaling. Um, mm. I like to drink like raspberry leaf tea with rose and hibiscus. That's like really like a womb tea for me. Um, mm -hmm. I like to drink cacao as well and just sit and, mm. and just to be. And if I make the intention, like my intention is I'm bleeding and all I'm doing is being with myself, then, you know, I've created the space and the container. So of course the medicine will arrive. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, I have definitely found that certain music is mm. so powerful and that just makes me think again about the shamanic journey because if you go and journey through um some type of process with the shaman there's usually always yeah. music involved so music yeah. is definitely powerful for me and so listening to you what i'm what i'm seeing in my mind is maybe um doing some certain things that you do specifically for your bleed time every month, mm -hmm. drinking a specific type of tea. Yeah. Maybe drinking there's... a tea. Um, you could have, uh, you could have a specific type of food that you feel really drawn to at that time. Usually it's chocolate. So always having that as your chocolate time, creating like a den. So even if you're in your, if you're staying in bed or you go to the couch or the lounge, um, like creating a den like space. And maybe that's the only time of the month that you do that. You could also do specific types of meditation. So rather than like a seated meditation where it's like an ascension, you could do listen to yoga nidras um, you know, more lying down or earth-based practices, um, a particular kind of practice. Maybe you do a breast massage or a womb massage on yourself at that time as an honoring mm. of, um, yeah, the womb massages. If you're not in, in any kind of pain, the womb massage is really nice. Sometimes it's too tender for some women, day one, day two. Mm. So then if the womb's too tender, do a breast massage, um, yeah, just anything that feels loving and connected. You might have a specific bath, you know, you might use specific mm. herbs like a flower bath, but specific herbs that feel very wormy for you, you know, and there's no right or wrong. You just go with what feels right for the individual. I like rose, hibiscus. Um, I also like putting coconut milk in my bath. Um, mm. Yeah, like that kind of like, it feels more like a warm hug than water. It's like when it's milky. So yeah. That sounds so luxurious. Yeah. I love baths. Baths are such powerful healing tools. Something about water mm -hmm. and the warmth. <laughs> it's yeah. very womb like. Going so, back into the womb. <laughs> yeah. Where we originally felt safe, hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Not for everyone. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that it's, it's unique for each woman and to basically kind of like get creative with the ways that feel good for you to honor that time yeah, and no right or wrong. Love and self-care practices are mm -hmm. cornerstone art, of, all of that. Art is always another one where some women love to color in or to draw or to get the clay out. In all honesty, yeah. day one, I am just like stillness. That's my ritual. Like 
nothing sometimes mm. music sometimes not even that like nothing from the outside yeah well then you can actually really really truly receive whatever is flowing through your channel during that time mm-hmm. i've been intuitively kind of like cluing in on the that like some sort of creative activity not something that like stimulates your thinking mind but mm-hmm. some way to just flow like allow that energy to flow and maybe just like a really gentle activity i've actually been thinking about um like starting to make some necklaces and mm-hmm. i just saw that breathe. for you <laughs> it's like maybe she could yeah. make jewelry <laughs> so i was you just yeah i need to get myself some beads mm-hmm. okay wow rebecca thank you so much we just uncovered a lot of really really awesome um, yeah. our conversation um so before we wrap up i would love for you to share with the audience um some of the services that you're offering right now how to get in touch with you yeah. and also you are offering a heart womb course gift to yeah. the audience mm-hmm. yeah that yeah so um well the heart womb course is all about connecting and awakening the heart the womb and the connection between the two um my offerings at the moment so i'm holding uh online womb healing circles so i hold them twice a month um usually two weeks apart uh, they're not usually linked with the moon but sometimes they land that way they just more land within this is the date that you have to do this and that's what gets birthed um i also offer one-to-one work so womb healing and also i offer rebirthing work for women to heal their own conception and gestation and birth which is paramount because that is our original imprint and then i also uh, work with women um in individually with conscious conception if they're on that path and, and i've got a group online immersion in the summer which is awakening the sexual gateways of the womb um so that begins around summer solstice and uh, yeah that'll be super fun and that's like an at-home course and live calls and practices and loads of stuff it's abundant with yeah it just keeps on coming through so um, i'm happy to share that too beautiful Thank you for that. I love that. Um, I love that some of your offerings are very unique to whatever stage you're at. That makes mm-hmm. them so much more special. Like yeah. you're not going to create this exact thing again. So it's, Mm-mm. it's even more helpful for the women that you share it with. Yeah. Yeah. There is that real piece, like with my work, if something's calling you now, you got to do it now because I might not be serving it next year (laughs) because I'll be somewhere else. And I always have to serve from my own embodied experience. So the Mm -hmm. work that I created two years ago just doesn't exist anymore because I'm not that version of myself and I need Mm -hmm. to be lit up as a facilitator. So where I am right now is where I'm serving from right now. (sighs) Beautiful. Yay. All of your services are amazing. Yay. I'm so grateful that we were able to do this. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your beautiful light with me and the audience. Um, Thank you. If you, yeah, it's been a joy. So if you don't feel like there's anything else that we need to share, Mm -hmm. then I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for your time. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Have a beautiful day. And um, definitely check out the links for her her gift for the audience. And I will make sure to give everybody your information. So if anybody wants to reach out, they can. So. Amazing. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Aloha. Mm-hmm.